Astronomy to GCSE, Topic 3.3, Physical Properties of Stars. So 1. The stars in a constellation are not physically related. By that I mean that the stars in constellation may appear close together, but in fact they could be really far apart. It's just the direction we are looking from that makes them look close together. In this made up asterism, the stars may appear close together, but really they are not, as some are 25 light years from Earth and another 524. So stars in the constellation may not be related gravitationally, as they may be very far away. However, stars in a cluster, so a globular or open cluster, are related gravitationally, like these ones. What I hope is obvious here is that these stars appear close together and so are gravitationally associated. So stars in the constellation are not physically related, but stars in a cluster are. 2. Optical, double and binary stars. Two stars that may appear close together will either be an optical double pair of stars or a binary pair of stars. Optical double stars are what they sound like. They look close together. Really, they could be quite far away, so optical double stars are not gravitationally related, nor near each other at all, they just appear close together. Binary stars, however, are both gravitationally related and near to each other. In fact, binary stars orbit their centre of gravity, just, how, just like how a massive exoplanet orbits its star. 3. The apparent magnitude and brightness of stars. The brightness of stars is measured by the magnitude scale. Magnitude is just a fancy word used to describe a difference in brightness seen between stars on the night sky. The magnitude system was invented by Hipparchus, a Greek astronomer in the 2nd century BC. He called the brightest stars 1 and the dimmest stars 6. So the lower the number, the brighter the star. The scale is logarithmic, so the difference in brightness between 1 and 2 is 2.5 times. The difference between 2 and 3 is 2.5 times. This means that the difference in brightness between 1 and 3 is 6.25 times, as that is 2.5 times 2.5. This means that the difference between 1 and 4 is 2.5 cubed, so is 15.25. So the difference between 1 and 5 is around 100 times. Since Hipparchus and his eyes, we have got more accurate machines to measure the brightness of stars. Telescopes have allowed us to see dimmer objects. Now we have telescopes which allow us to see dimmer stars uh, which have a magnitude greater than 6. It may seem strange, but you could also see objects that are brighter than magnitude of 1. So these objects will have, some of them will have a negative magnitude. For example, the full moon has a magnitude of around negative 12 and the sun of around negative 26. And Sirius, the brightest star, has a magnitude of negative 1.47. 4. Calculations based on apparent magnitude. If star A has an apparent magnitude of 3 and star B has an apparent magnitude of 4, then how many times brighter is star A than B? Well, as the difference in magnitudes is 1 between the two stars, star A is therefore 2.5 times brighter. OK, let's try another. If star C has an apparent magnitude of negative 1 and star D has an apparent magnitude of 1, then how many times brighter is star C than D? As the difference in magnitudes is 2, since 1 minus minus 1 is 2, then 2.5 to the power of the difference is 6.25, as 2.5 times 2.5 is 6.25. 5. Using heliocentric parallax to determine the distance to nearby stars. This sounds more complex than it really is, trust me. It is hard to accurately know the distances to stars as they are so far away and we can never travel there ourselves. 
Astronomers cannot use rulers or beam signals across the universe as the distances to stars are so huge. So instead they use parallax error. Parallax error is the apparent movement of an object when viewed from a different line of sight. So here each eye sees the yellow ball in front of a different line. Another example of parallax error is that a speedometer in a car reads incorrectly from the passenger seat as they have a different line of sight. In astronomy, stars can appear to move and the amount they move can be used to calculate how far away they are. And this is how. As the Earth rotates around the Sun, it will get two viewpoints of the stars, causing an apparent motion relative to the background of stars. The star isn't moving, it's us. This is why it's called apparent motion. Once astronomers know the angular shift, they can halve it to get the parallax angle. Now you have a right angle triangle, where you know an angle and a side. The shortest side in light brown is the distance between the Earth and the Sun, so one astronomical unit. Using Sokotoa you can calculate the distance to the star in blue. In this case you want the tan of the parallax angle. 6. Parsecs. In astronomy, we use different units for different lengths, as some are more useful than others. Meters and kilometers are useful as they are the standard units for science. Astronomical units are useful for measuring distances inside our solar system. Outside our solar system, they're a bit too small, so we have to use light years or parsecs. So, what is a parsec? A parsec is the distance at which a star would have the parallax angle of one arc second. You'll be familiar that angles are measured in degrees. Well, a 60th of a degree is called a minute, and a 60th of a minute is called a second. So an arc sec, or arc second, is one 3,600th of a degree. So it's a very small angle. So again, a parsec is the distance a star needs to be to have a parallax angle of a second. 7. More on magnitude. There are two types of magnitude, apparent magnitude and absolute magnitude. Apparent magnitude is represented by little m and absolute by capital M. Apparent magnitude is how bright a star appears from Earth. However, if one was trying to compare the true brightness of stars, that would not be very useful since stars closer to Earth appear brighter than those of identical power further away. To make comparisons easier, astronomers came up with a second measurement of stellar magnitude, absolute magnitude. This is the brightness stars would appear if they were all the same distance from Earth. Obviously, a standard distance that absolute magnitude will be measured from had to be chosen, and that distance is 10 parsecs. So if a star is at a distance of 10 parsecs, then little m equals big M, or apparent magnitude equals absolute magnitude. This means that stars closer than 10 parsecs have a dimmer absolute magnitude than apparent magnitude, and it also means that stars further away have a brighter absolute magnitude as they would become brighter as they moved closer to a distance of 10 parsecs. 8. Inverse square law and the intensity of light. The intensity of light emitted from a star decreases with the distance. This relationship between the distance from the star and the intensity of light is described by the inverse square law. So we are familiar with a square, like x squared. An inverse square, instead of being x squared, is 1 over x squared. So the reciprocal of x squared. This means that as the distance between you and the star is doubled, the light intensity is quartered. And when the distance is tripled, the light intensity becomes only a 9th. 9. The equation that links capital M and little m, that's absolute magnitude and apparent magnitude. So we know that apparent and absolute magnitude are linked, and that at a distance of 10 parsecs they are identical. 
So if we know the distance to a star and its apparent magnitude, then can we calculate the absolute magnitude? The answer is yes, and using this equation, which says that absolute magnitude is equal to apparent magnitude plus 5 minus 5 times log d, where d is the distance in parsecs. So what you might be wondering is what is the log? Log is short for logarithm, which you don't really need to know about, but essentially log 10 is 1, log 100 is 2, log 1000 is 3, etc. You will be asked to calculate capital M or lowercase m for GCSE, so you don't need to worry about logarithms, but you can use the log button on your scientific calculator to help you with this equation. So, time for a question. If the absolute magnitude, so capital M, is minus 22, and the distance is 10 megaparsecs, then what is the apparent magnitude? So what is little m? To start with, we need to know how many parsecs 10 megaparsecs is. Now, 10 megaparsecs is 10 million, as a megaparsec is 1 million parsecs. So, put log 10 million into the calculator and we get 7. 7 times 5 is 35. Okay, so we've now done the 5 log d bit part of the equation. We now have 5 minus 35. And this is 30, or minus 30. If we reorder the equation, we get 30 minus 22 equals lowercase m. And 30 minus 22 is 8. So the apparent magnitude of this star is 8. 10. Variable stars. There are two types of variable stars you need to know for astronomy GCSE. And these are binary stars and Cepheid variables. Binary stars are two stars that orbit a common barycenter, which is a fancy word for centre of mass. When the smaller, dimmer star passes in front of the larger star, there is a drop in brightness, as the smaller, dimmer star emits less light. As the two stars orbit each other, they pass in front of each other, which reduces the intensity of light reaching the observer. The smaller star has less fusion taking place as it's smaller, therefore it is less intense. This is why there is a dimming when the smaller star passes across the face of the larger star. The period of this binary system is four days, as the time between the stars being in the same position is four days. The second type of variable star is called a Cepheid variable. A Cepheid variable does not vary its brightness because of the second star, but instead because the star is pulsing. In a Cepheid, the star changes its temperature and diameter regularly. These change its brightness. The typical light curve for a Cepheid variable is a steep rise in intensity and then a slower drop. To calculate the periodicity of a Cepheid, you either need to find the time between peaks or troughs in the intensity. So the period for this Cepheid will be six days, as that's the difference between one and seven. The length of these periods are directly proportional to the luminosity of the star, that's its brightness, so its absolute magnitude, which is useful as the absolute magnitude can be assumed from the length of these periods. So if we know the absolute magnitude from the periodicity of the Cepheid, and we know the apparent magnitude from looking at it, then we can use the capital M equals M plus 5 minus 5 times log D equation to calculate the distance to these Cepheids. This can be very useful for calculating the distances to these stars. 11. What information can be obtained from a spectrum of a star? So what is the spectrum of a star? If you split white light with a prism, you get all of the colours. In fact, you also get the entire electromagnetic spectrum, so you also get infrared, radio waves, ultraviolet, etc. If you split the light coming from a star like this, you'll find that there are missing colours. 
These colours correspond to elements, so we can find out a lot about the star using its spectrum. A huge amount of information can be obtained by looking at the spectra of stars. It is awesome to know how much information can be found out by a star just from analysing its spectrum. So it's nice considering the whole list, but there are a few important ones I would commit to memory. These would be chemical composition. Different specific colours are associated with different elements. By looking at the colours in the spectrum of the star, the chemical composition of the star can be identified. The next one's temperature. The temperature of the star can also be identified from its spectrum, just like how we use infrared thermometers to measure the temperature of objects electronically. We can use the colours of the stars to determine their temperature. The magnitude of the star can be determined just by measuring it from Earth. Be careful to call it the scientifically correct term magnitude rather than the lay term brightness. The luminosity, another fancy word for absolute magnitude, can be calculated by knowing the magnitude and the distance to the star. Radial velocity is the speed the star is moving to or from the observer. This is very useful for detection of exoplanets. Stars are put into groups, so classified, according to their spectral type. By spectral type we mean temperature, but also colour, as different colours correspond to different temperatures. So a blue star is always hot, and a red star is always cold. Relatively though, you still couldn't touch it. The hottest stars are over 25,000 Kelvin, and are blue in colour, and classified as O. Blue-white stars are B, white stars A, yellow-white F, yellow G, orange K, and red is M. You don't need to remember the temperature boundaries, really, but be aware of the colour change from hot blue to white to yellow and eventually colder reds. But one thing you do need to remember is O, B, A, F, G, K, M. This may seem really difficult, but there is an easy mnemonic to remember it. O, be a fine girl, kiss me, or O, be a fine guy, kiss me. If you are wondering what spectral type the sun is, it's G. If the spectral type, which is the temperature of the star, is plotted against the luminosity, so absolute magnitude of the star, then we have what is called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. The main components of an HR diagram are the different types of star. The central band that goes from a low luminosity at M to a higher luminosity at B is called the main sequence. The clump of bright but cold red stars that are KMs are the red giants. The supergiants are the brightest stars above even the giants. The little clump of stars with a low luminosity but very hot um, over at O and B are the white dwarfs. If you don't get how a hot star can have a low luminosity and how a cold star can have a high luminosity, then you have to remember that brightness, absolute magnitude, which are all luminosity, depend on the amount of light released by a star, which is related to the amount of fusion going on in the star and therefore the size of the star. Thank you very much for listening. This is the end of Astronomy to GCSE topic 3.3 physical properties of stars. See you next time.